Good morning. Hey, welcome everybody. My name is Tim, if we've never met before, and our scripture reading, the scripture reader that I had lined up for us this morning uh, called and had a family emergency. Everybody's okay, but there was a family emergency and they couldn't make it. And so Ben is here, and he just found out like 10 minutes ago he was going to be your scripture today. Let's give it a hand. Fun, fun fact before I turn it over to Ben. Ben is something of a Hebrew and Greek scholar. So he's one of those people that I call to say, am I saying this the right way? Right? Yeah. But he's going to read in English. So here's Ben. <laughs> Morning, everyone. Our scripture reading today is in the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verses 1 through 13. You can find that on page 886 in the Bible under the chairs in front of you. This is what John says. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light. The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own people, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And as Pastor Prince says, because we are overachievers here, we have a second scripture reading from the first chapters of Genesis. Genesis 1, 26 through 27 says, Then God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Then the Lord God formed the man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living creature. And that last verse was Genesis 2, verse 7, in case you were wondering. And this is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. Thank you, Ben. Some of you may be wondering, why doesn't Prince just read the scripture himself? Because... I think it's good for you to show up with a healthy fear that you might have to go on camera at any time, okay? So dress well and have your brain turned on when you come to church, okay? Is that too much to ask? Just come knowing it could happen to you anytime. I grabbed him actually trying to leave the building and put him on stage. So you're not really safe till you're in your car and not a lot. Just we're all on the same page, okay? All right, keep your Bibles open to John chapter 1. That's page 886. And... Uh, in our, our Advent series here, we're reflecting on some of these words that we actually just sang this morning. Veiled in flesh, the Godhead see, hail the incarnate deity. Mild he lays his glory by, born that man no more may die, born to raise us from the earth, born to give us second birth. Even if you're not a churchgoer, you have probably heard or sung these words virtually every year uh, of your life. And to prepare for Christmas, we're reflecting on these words from the opening uh, verses of the Gospel of John. And part of John's message is that if you're really going to understand what has happened with Jesus, you need to be asking not just who is Jesus, but who was Jesus. Uh, in the sense of who was Jesus before he was revealed as Jesus, before the beginning. Who was Jesus and what does that mean? Who exactly has been veiled in flesh? And this week, we are coming to the subject of life. Mild he lays his glory by, born that man 
no more may die, born to raise us from the earth, born to give us second birth. And in verse four of our reading today, it says, in him was life, and that life was the light of men. Then he adds in verse 11, Jesus came to his own and his own people did not receive him, but to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but born of God. There is no other book of the Bible that talks about life more than the Gospel of John. In fact, it is not even close. This is the Gospel of life. And in the Gospel of John, life is usually uh, paired with the adjective eternal. As in, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever would believe in him would not perish but have eternal life. Or John 17, 3, this is eternal life. Jesus says that they would know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you've sent. Those words are on nearly every page of the Gospel of John and in nearly every story in the Gospel of John. Eternal life, resurrection life, abundant life. These are all synonyms for the same thing. And he's talking about, obviously talking about more than biology. Uh, he's talking about life in its entirety. That is life in the body, life in the mind, life in the spirit. And it's not a feeble life either. But we're talking here about life that is animated by the power of God himself. In scripture, whenever the spirit of God or the spirit of life comes over people, they're empowered to just do incredible things. That's the life that we're talking about. One of the things that uh, naturalism has stolen from us. So naturalism is just, it's in the air that we breathe. It's the, the outlook that says, you know, the universe is a closed system and only what we can see is what is actually there. Well, one of the things that it's stolen from us is, is hope that there can be a genuine transformation or genuine healing. So if you're struggling, mentally, physically, emotionally, well, you know, we'll do the best that we can for you with what we've got, but this is the hand that nature has dealt you, and there's no power outside of this system that's going to heal you. Well, along comes Christianity to say, actually, there is a life, Jesus calls it eternal life, resurrection life, abundant life, that is of such a higher order than we are familiar with. And it is so complete that we can hardly conceive of it. Uh, it, it it's hard to believe. And what we're going to do today is to try to describe what that life is. Okay? This week I, I ran into a friend on Thursday and we were just chatting he's not a follower of Jesus but a very very gracious person and he was saying to me you know just like there are people who just seem born with a natural athletic ability he said it seems like there are people who are just uh, born naturally spiritual they just seem to get spiritual things they have this connection with God that's enviable and there's there's peace and there's understanding and they're good people and uh, he was saying to me you know, that you, me, Tim Prince, uh, you know, you're one of those people. I think he even said, you know, spirituality just seems to come so naturally to you. And it wasn't the time or place to have the conversation, but I, I wanted to say, you clearly did not know me when I was 15. <laughs> and you ha he's only known me after 25 years of learning to walk with Jesus. He's only known me after 25 years of wrestling with issues that at times, especially in my 20s, I thought would never go away. I thought it's just always going to be this way. He's only known me after 18 years of being married to a woman who also loves Jesus and a lifetime of relationship with the church. Five or six years ago, 
I was, I, don't, I was sorting or I was cleaning out our boiler room or something like that, and I came across a bunch of my old high school stuff, and I found this letter that I wrote to a girlfriend when I was 17, and it was awful. It was, I, when I found it, I remembered writing it. I did not remember hiding it. It had gone out of my mind, and I just, I began to read it, and I thought, Thank you, God, that I did not send this to this person. It, th think of the most narcissistic, neurotic, self-absorbed, cocky, but somehow incredibly insecure person. And, and that letter is gone. Okay, it's gone to the Great Recycling Center in the sky. Or I may have burned it. I just thought, if my children find this letter, they will lose all respect for me. But I thought on Thursday, I thought, I wish I could give this letter to my friend and say, this is me. This is me two years into following Jesus. When Jesus says, I have come that you might have abundant life, that is not a feeble promise. In him was life. And that life has its own intrinsic, life-changing power that begins working on you immediately and will, will move you from glory to glory and life to life. So today we're going to talk about what is life, what does that mean, what is John talking about? Then we're, gonna, we're also going to talk about what is death. Okay, so if this is life, what is death? And then we're going to talk about how do we enter in. And uh, today we're also going to have a few rabbit trails that we go down. Isn't that going to be fun? Just a few asides, a few bunny trails that we're going to go down as well. All right, what is life? As with everything else in these introductory verses of John, his understanding of life is rooted in the creation story of Genesis, where we read about the creation of humanity and God's intention for us. And there are a couple things that make the creation of humanity really unique but chief among them is that we have been created at, in the image of God. So here, here's Genesis 1, uh, verse 26. And God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and the birds of the heavens, and blah, blah, let, them, let them rule over everything. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him male and female. He created them. I just want you to notice uh, by way of observation that you do not have the image of God, but that you are the image of God. Meaning that anything that God is, you are in miniature. Okay? This would be a fun exercise when you get home today. Think about any attribute of God that you can, and you will find that same attribute in a limited scope within yourself. It's an incredible thought. Well, one of the ways that we image God is that you and I are spirits. Again, it's not that you have a spirit, but you are a spirit. You're, you're a soul. In Genesis 2-7, it says, Then the Lord God formed the man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living soul, a, a living creature. There's kind of the same idea there. Now, I've... Uh, I've heard this taught before, and I think I've probably taught it this way before, that the, the reason uh, we have the Spirit of God is because that's what God breathed into Adam in Genesis 2-7. The Spirit of God actually is not mentioned there in that verse, but it talks about uh, the breath of life. So all living creatures, if you read Genesis, all living creatures have this breath of life. Also, all living creatures uh, have the, are, are called living souls or living creatures. That actually doesn't make us unique either. It's the way that these are brought together that's unique. It's actually the scene in Genesis chapter 2 that is unique. In Genesis, all of the other creatures are created by divine fiat, by command. God speaks and the earth produces living creatures. But with Adam, okay, in Genesis 2-7, God personally formed him 
from the dust of the earth. Actually, Job, later on, Job will say that every single human being, with every human being, God is like a potter molding clay. With everything else in creation, God speaks and it is so, but with humanity, God gets dirty and intimate and right in there, and he creates. And then it says that God breathed the breath of life into Adam personally. And that's not true with any other creature. What makes Genesis 2-7 unique is that only humanity receives its spirit directly from God. So for as long as people have been reading Genesis, they have seen here the activity of the Holy Spirit because God breathes his own life into Adam and that's a part of our imageness. We have God's own you know, kind of soul life. There's an immaterial, eternal part of our being that comes directly from God. Now, we also image God in the fact that we have bodies. Uh, now, immediately, you know, the thought is, well, hold on. God doesn't have a body. Scripture's really clear about that. God has no body. That's true, but God does reveal himself through the word. Okay, we've talked about this the last couple of weeks. Uh, the word of God reveals or makes tangible to us the inner thoughts of God, the intentions of God, and his heart. Well, in the same way, you and I express our spirits through our bodies. Our spirits, the human spirit, was tailor-made and perfectly adopted for bodies. It's through our bodies that our spirits look out on the world. Okay, it's, it's in our brains that our spirits process the world. It's, it's with our hands that your spirit expresses affection to other people. It's with your vocal cords that your spirit speaks to loved ones. Okay, now, and, and damaged or disabled bodies which we all have at some level at this point, okay? Damaged or disabled bodies can hinder the expression of the spirit, but the soul is still there within a person. That's why we protect uh, people who are disabled. So just as God does everything through his word, we do everything through our bodies. I dare you this week, try to do something without your body. I would love to hear how that goes. It's, it's also, it just, it's not insignificant, by the way, that the word also has now put on a body like ours forever. So here's rabbit trail number one. This makes you incredibly cool. This makes you incredibly, remarkably unique in the created order. There is no other part of creation that brings together heaven and earth the way that you do. Uh, angels are spirits without bodies. Their, their spirit isn't fit to a body. Animals uh, have bodies but do not have spirits like ours. Humanity occupies a completely unique niche in the created order where the visible and the invisible come together in a completely unique way. And life, according to Genesis, life is when spirit and body are in perfect alignment. Now we are so far from this at this point in the history of humanity that this is hard to believe. But life in Genesis is when soul and body are animating and strengthening one another in perfect harmony and death is when those two things begin to come apart. To die in scripture is to breathe out one's soul for the, for the last time. In the crucifixion, it says that Jesus breathed out or gave up his soul. That's what it means to die. And the thing is that all of us are experiencing that already. Especially if you're over the age of 40, okay? You're already... We came home from church last week and Caleb had a few of his teenage buddies over and we played basketball in the driveway. 
I dominated, I just, I want that on the record, but I, I felt it. And I thought, this, this is how guys pop their Achilles right now. This, I'm going to do it right now. This is because what the spirit is willing, the flesh is like, no, dude, we're not doing that anymore, right? <laughs> well, I, that's, that's a death. They're not in sync anymore. It's, it's starting to come apart. Another way that we are the image of God, and this gets a little more complicated, but is that our souls share in God's faculties. They share in God's giftings. And what I mean by that is that your soul has a heart and a mind, and from those proceed your will. Okay? Uh, Proverbs 4.23. It says, guard your heart, for from it flow the springs are the issues of life. The heart is the seat of all emotions, passions, urges, inclinations, attachments, and desires. It's the center of your being. This is just, this is counseling 101, okay? The mind is how we, you know, the, your mind kind of goes out, takes in information, and brings it back to process in the heart. Your mind is the seat of all impressions, all perceptions, observations, thoughts, knowledge, and wisdom. And then together, those two things, uh, from those proceed everything that we do, your will. Your decisions and actions flow from your heart and are subject to your mind. And all of these things are true of God as well. Okay, rabbit trail number two, and it's super cool, okay? But rabbit trail number two is that so the church throughout history has taught that this is one of the ways we image God. Okay, so the Father is the source of all things, just as your heart is the source of all that you do. And just as the Son goes, is, you know, proceeds eternally from the Father and returns, you know, bringing us back to the Father, so your mind goes out and gathers in, and just as the Spirit of God proceeds from Father and Son into the world to actually do His will, so also your will proceeds from your heart and your mind out into the world. It's incredible that you, every individual person, you're a little trinity right there. You are the image of God. And it, the sheer diversity and abundance of God's gifts at work within you are a reflection of God. Do you ever feel like a really complicated person? Are you married to a really complicated person? That would be a better, are you married, thank you, Tone. Are you married to a, comp to whose, whose words don't always match their actions and whose, whose desires aren't always in line with what they actually do? You know, it's because we're, the soul is this incredibly well-built thing and it's coming apart. We are in miniature what God is infinitely and this is, this is why Humans are, are of an even higher order than angels because we are just plain old more complex. No one can glorify God and enjoy him the way that you can because only humanity actually shares in all of these different aspects of their being. Your soul is custom built to love and enjoy God in a way that nothing else in all of creation is. And that is life. Life is when all of these things are operating in perfect harmony and energized by the life of God himself. I mean, can you imagine a day where your emotions, passions, urges, and inclinations are in perfect harmony with your thoughts, your knowledge, and your wisdom, and they result in perfectly made decisions and actions. You've never had that day, okay? And all of that pulsing with the personal, powerful life of God to his glory, this is what you were made for. Why are the wages of sin death. Why is that the law? Because what sin does, its whole purpose 
is to come into this perfectly united, perfectly ordered system and just start ripping stuff apart. So that what happens is our desires, James chapter 4, our desires are at war within us. Romans chapter 1, our passions are all disordered and pointing off in different directions. Our mouths just say things we don't even mean. Have you ever said something you didn't really mean? Our thoughts become darkened, Ephesians 4. Our wisdom turns to foolishness, 1 Corinthians 2. The heart embraces lies and on. It's just chaos. It's chaos within that moves out into chaos in all of our relationships. Paul says in, in Romans 7, I don't understand myself. I just can't understand what I'm doing. He says, I see this law at work in my members, meaning all the different constituent parts of my being. That even when I want to do good, evil is right there beside me. And then he cries out, wretched man that I am, who will save me from this body of death? In him was life. And that life was the light of men. So how do we enter the life that Jesus brings? It's simple. It's powerful. It's mysterious. Those three things. Simple, powerful, mysterious. Back to John chapter 1, verse 10. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Entering life is simple. To all who received him and believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Receiving Christ means to receive him as you would a friend and a king. It means to open your heart to him as you would to another person and ask him to be with you, to lead you, to change you, to heal you. And he gives you life. To believe in the name of Jesus just means to, to believe him, to trust him. When he says that I'm a sinner, I believe him. When he says that his death was an atoning sacrifice for my sin, I believe him. When he says that he was raised for my salvation, I agree. To believe in the name of Jesus is simply to say, whoever you are and whatever you say, I trust. This can happen in your chair right now. It's that simple. Okay, well, why don't more people jump on that? Well, verse 5, the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not understood it, has not overcome it. Verse 10, he was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not know him. See, it's, it's not in the nature of dead things to know that they're dead. Jesus' life, uh, verse 5 says, was like a light in the darkness. What do dead things do when you shine a light in their eyes? Nothing, because they're dead. They don't respond in any way. And what scripture teaches from beginning to end is that in our natural state, we are not capable of responding to spiritual light. And so Jesus comes into our world and we're like, who are you? What do you want? Let's get him. The first step uh, is coming to grips with the fact that we're dead. Now a spiritually dead person may lead a wonderfully productive life. They may have many warm relationships. They may give themselves to many wonderful causes, but spiritually, they're unresponsive. A person may hear, you know, of the sinfulness of humanity or the, the crucifixion of Jesus, and they're unmoved. Or they may find it demeaning 
What do you mean I'm dead? I'm spiritually dead. How dare you? Or they, they may just find it boring. It's just not very interesting to them. Or a spiritually dead person may say, I believe that. But they're not moved by it. They're, there's no sight. There's no hearing. There's no delight in Jesus. But when life comes, you find suddenly that you can't get enough of reflection on what Jesus has done. You find you can't get enough of conversation about who he is. And you find yourself saying, how did I never see this before? Well, you were dead. And dead people don't know they're dead. The other reason we don't always jump at this is because the life of God comes by grace. It's almost too simple. We hear receive Jesus and believe in his name and he's gonna fill me with his own personal life-giving power? Most people, when they first begin to come to grips with their need for God, okay, life is not working on its own, and we feel the need for something and we begin to turn to God or we begin to turn to religion, one of the, the first things we do, and we all do this, is to say, I'm gonna reform. I'm gonna turn over a new leaf. I'm gonna do better. I'm gonna be more religious. I'm gonna go to church. I'm gonna take spiritual things more seriously. And almost inevitably, we become more miserable after a year. We say, goodness, I thought Jesus gave life and here I'm just feeling weighed down and crushed under the weight of new things that I need to worry about. And it's, it's because you don't understand. The Bible doesn't say you're spiritually sick and you need, to, you need medicine. The Bible doesn't say you're spiritually lazy and you need to, to work harder. The Bible doesn't say that you're spiritually weak and you need to be stronger. It says you're dead. And you need to be born of God. And it's great. It's all grace. It's a great picture of the spiritual life, being born of God. How, how many of you have been born? How many of you have been? Just raise your hand if you were born. Go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Good. How, how was it? How'd it go? I mean, how was the experience? You were there. You were there. I mean, was it, was it good? I mean, was it fun? I mean, maybe for you, probably not your mom. But it, it just, it was all of grace, wasn't it? She did all the work, and here you are. And then sustained you for how many years to keep you on your feet? And so it is with the life of God. Jesus says, I'm, it's not gonna do you any good to try to turn over a new leaf. It's not, I'm not asking you to reform yourself. I'm not gonna make you a better person. If you receive me, I am going to put your old self to death and I'm gonna raise you to a completely new life. And it begins immediately. It's really simple. It's really powerful too. To receive Jesus and believe in his name is to receive that same spirit that was breathed into Adam in Genesis 2. That scene where God personally breathes his own life into Adam, that is conversion. That's why it's so powerful. The same spirit of God that brought life to all living things and then raised Jesus from the dead is the same spirit he promises to every person that believes on the Lord Jesus and receives him. And he is the spirit of life. He goes to work immediately, knitting back together all the parts of your soul that sin has so badly broken apart. And some of those things you will notice immediately, and some take 25 years. But Paul says, even so, even as our bodies are wasting away, Paul says, our spirits are being renewed day by day from one degree of glory to another. Every single person here and every single person in the world is moving toward either greater and greater degrees of glory and wholeness and life in the spirit of God or into greater and greater degrees of decay and corruption and horror. You are either at this moment 
getting tastes of that resurrection life to come or tastes of hell. But to those who receive him, to any who would believe in his name, the promise of Jesus is, I will give you life. You're not spiritually sick, you're dead. And I will breathe life into you as I did into Adam today, today. And I will get you home. It's simple, it's powerful. And finally, it's mysterious. Verse 13 says that these are children not born of blood, nor the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but born of God. It's mysterious in the sense that it is, you cannot see it, and it is hard to explain. Years, well, I've shared with you before in this series, every week I've said one of the reasons I love the Gospel of John is because when people come to me with spiritual questions or they're just trying to sort things out, I say, hey, these are great questions and if you're serious, would you read the Gospel of John with me and write down all your questions. We'll get together every week and you, we'll just talk. We'll just, I just want, I'm not trying to sell you anything, I'm trying to introduce you to someone. The very first time I did that was almost 20 years ago. His name was Zeke. He was a university student and he'd come to a meeting where I had spoken and he filled out a little card that said, hey, I, I'm Zeke and I have questions about spiritual things, so we got together. And he'd never, never really been in church at all in his life, he'd never picked up the Bible before, but he had a really good friend on the football team in high school who was a Christian. And he admired this person and he came to college to sort this out. He wanted to know what, what was the deal with his friend. And I said, Zeke, these are great questions if you're serious. Would you read the Gospel of John with me? And he did that. He would come every week. He was very faithful with three chapters read and all these questions written out. But I remember when we got to John chapters 14, 15, and 16, which is where, where Jesus begins explaining and describing the Holy Spirit and what the Holy Spirit is going to do in you once he comes to you. And I, I remember where we were sitting in the student center. That's how vivid this is in my mind. And he said, what is the deal with the Holy Spirit? What does all of this mean? And I had to say, I don't know how to explain this to you. I said, Zeke, there are some things about the Christian life that you just have to experience to know. And uh, that, the, the thing about Zeke is that he was an incredible person. He, he was an amazing athlete. He went on to play Division I football. He caught, caught a touchdown in the Rose Bowl, played for the Chicago Bears for a while. He was a genius, an engineering student. He's doing great things today. And he was just a good-looking kid. I mean, a Calvin Klein model, if ever there were. He was the quintessential women want to be with him and men want to be him kind of person. I remember, as he was reading through the Gospel of John that fall, saying to the Lord, I just don't know what you really have to offer this person. He has everything. Well, we finished the Gospel of John. You know, we went away on Christmas break. He came back. He continued to kind of hang around Christian circles and things like that. Around Easter, he reached out to me again. And he said, I want to have dinner. I have one more question for you. I said, okay. So we got together at Steve's Pizza. And uh, after playing a little pool and eating pizza, I said, okay, Zeke, what's the deal? He said, okay, well, you, you've answered all my questions, or I've got all my questions answered. Just one more. So if I want to be a Christian, what do I do? I mean, he literally said, do you like take out a sword and you touch me on both shoulders? And then I'm like, <laughs> I'm like in the club then, or what, what happens? I said, Zeke, well, you've, you've read it. You believe in the Lord Jesus. And you tell him that that's what you want. And uh, I haven't had this ha happen very often, by the way, but there in the booth at Steve's Pizza, he said, well, that's what I want. And immediately, I mean, you could see it on his face. I, I cannot describe to you what happened, but he literally sat up in the booth and he said, what was that? I said, Zeke, that is either the pizza 
or the, that is the Holy Spirit. And he said, this is the Holy Spirit? I said, yeah. This is what you've been trying to tell me for a year? I said, yeah. And he just floated home. In him was life. And life abundantly. That's what John is talking about here. And all that is needed is that you would believe and say, that's what I want. Let's pray before we wrap up. Maybe some of you here today are saying, that's what I want. Would you tell him now? And for all the rest of us, all of us have loved ones in our lives that we wish would know what we're talking about. Would you pray for them by name right now? Almighty God, thank you for your word and for your son, Jesus. We ask together for each other and for our loved ones that you would cause light to shine in the darkness and give life so that we might see. We bring before you the names of every loved one that's come to mind today. Would you show them the same mercy that you've shown to us Open their eyes to see and do it today. Do it this week. Would you do whatever is necessary to awaken them to their need for life? And we pray it for ourselves. God, would you give that life and sustain it in us, we ask through Jesus. Everyone said? Amen. Let's stand and sing.